Hey, greetings to you, my friends and brethren, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is Brother Clinton. Welcome to my office once again. It is the fifth day of the week, the 18th of the month. It is called August, but we know that the Lord alone is August. Glory to his name. And um, I have a message for you that is has been inspired by something that a sister just wrote to me, and I'd like to share with you a little bit of her letter. She says, hello, Brother Clinton. God bless you and your family. Thank you for that, sister. Um, she says, thank you for your new video, which she's referring to the one I made yesterday, and in the process of listening to it and learning more. The reason I'm writing is because I'm sort of confused, she says. Why do I struggle with sin daily? Paul talked about this saying he wants to be good, but he can't, and doesn't want to sin, but does. Paraphrasing that, correct me if I'm wrong, she says. I thought that through Jesus Christ I would overcome. Maybe it takes time, and there's that word again, time. There's not much of it now. She says, how can I enter the kingdom if I'm repenting daily from thoughts and deeds? Some days I'm depressed and my heart doesn't feel anything. My desire is to do work in God's kingdom now and in the future. I want to be able to do this. I, I witness to my family and try to be very supportive. Sometimes it's overwhelming. I'm so tired. Any thoughts on this? And she signed it your sister in Christ, and I'm not going to mention her name because I don't have her permission to do so, but she is a sister in Christ indeed, a very blessed and dear sister, and she's young in the faith and just so filled with zeal and love for the Lord Jesus Christ. And I praise God for you, sister, and others like you. You're one of those very few that God has given me that I wish I could just lift you up in front of the world and hold you up for an example of what a Christian woman should be. I've seen God change you so much in such a short time. Blessed be the name of the Lord, and I know that he will perfect that which concerneth you. Addressing the questions that you asked. You know, I, I went over that kind of in, in Romans chapter 7 when, I did, when I'm in the midst of doing a series on Romans. For those of you who don't know, there's a playlist on this channel called Romans, uh, the book of Romans. And when we did chapter 7, when we went through chapter 7, we saw the things that you were talking about, about uh, what Paul had said in the 7th chapter of Romans. So let's just go there. Romans chapter 7. And I'm not going to spend as much time there now as I did in the video on Romans 7. So the reason I mentioned that video is so that you or the, all of those of you out there who may be wondering about that particular passage and what exactly Paul was talking about in that passage, you can go back to Romans chapter 7, the video that I did. In fact, I'll leave a link to it below in the information box. And uh, let me just make a note of that so I remember to do that. And here we are in Romans chapter 7, and you can understand more about this by the, in detail by the video that I made earlier. But um, in Romans chapter 7, as we skip down to verse 18, well, no, let's, let's go back a little bit. Let's go to uh, verse 14. Let's begin Romans chapter 7, verse 14. Pardon me for my hesitation there. It's just that when I make these videos, I don't write down a bunch of notes and plan beforehand what I'm going to say. I just get on my knees and ask the Lord to bless the words that are going to come out of my mouth, and that the words that I speak may be from the well of His Spirit through me to you, whoever you are out there, to bless you. And that's what He does. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So Romans chapter 7, 14 says, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. All right Now, of course, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, did not literally mean that he was carnal because he was a Christian. All right? Now, Brother Clinton, what are you saying? That it's a parable that Paul didn't really mean what he said? No, I'm not saying that at all. all right? And this, uh, for those of you who are watching this video, you know better than that. Okay, So I'm not going to even entertain foolishness, foolishness like that in the comment section and so forth. But we know that Paul was not carnal as in the sense of not having the spirit like he like he spoke to the to, to the church at Corinth in the third chapter of 1 Corinthians. No, he said, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. What he was talking about was the fact that his flesh is one thing, and the spirit that is in him is another thing. And the flesh is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit contrary to the flesh, so that you cannot do the things that you would, like it's written in Galatians. So that's why we are commanded by the apostle to walk after the spirit and not after the flesh. You see, for he says, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do I allow not, for what I would, that I that do I not, but what I hate, that do I. 
Now, of course, he's not saying that he, as an apostle of Christ, has no power over sin and is still a slave to sin and is forced to do those things which he doesn't want to do. He's talking about the difference between his flesh and his spirit, and that his flesh is, a, is, is an entity all its own, with a will all its own, which will must be suppressed, which will must be kept under subjection. You see, that's why he said in another place, for I keep my body under, under subjection. You see, because the body, the flesh, has a mind of its own. The carnal mind is enmity against God. Neither is it subject to the law of God. Okay, or it cannot be. See, so there is a carnal mind and there is a spiritual mind. There is the flesh that we live in and there is the spirit of God that is in us. And just the, because the spirit of God that is in us is in us doesn't mean that the flesh doesn't, isn't still alive and doesn't still have a will and desire to do that, which is evil. You see, let's go on. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. So Paul's using this as an example to show us that the law is good. See, the law is not done away. The law is good. Even though it brings condemnation, that's a good thing. Because if it didn't bring condemnation, then we wouldn't know about our sinfulness. And we wouldn't know that we need a Savior. Therefore, the law is our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, as it's written in Galatians. See, but I digress from that because I'm kind of getting off into another subject. But the question that this sister asked me is, why do I keep struggling with sin? All right, and the reason is very simple. It's because we live on a battlefield. It's because this flesh, even though we have been saved by the gospel of Christ, and when I say we have been saved, I'm talking about those who are my brethren who are baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost. That's what's called being born of water and of the Spirit, and that's how a man or a woman can enter into the kingdom of God. Those of us who are saved, we are saved from the power of darkness so that we can live in the light. We are saved from the power of sin so that we can overcome, so that we can win the battle, you see. Now, the sister said, I thought I was supposed to overcome. Okay, overcome isn't something that is handed to you. It is something that is made available to you, you see. Overcoming doesn't mean that you know, when you obey the gospel of Christ, all of a sudden the temptation of sin just goes away. And we're just walking all happily and everything with no temptation around us and we don't have any desire to sin anymore. No, it's not like that because overcome is a, is a word that means to conquer. You see, he that overcometh, he that conquereth. And we are more than conquerors through him that loved us by the things that we suffer for his name as we go through this life. So to overcome, that doesn't mean, sister, that when we obey the gospel of Jesus Christ, that sin just goes away. It doesn't. And remember that. Let's go over to 1 John while I'm speaking. Remember that sin is a reality whether you're a Christian or a sinner, whether you're a saint or a sinner. Sin is a reality because even though you're saved from your sins, you still live in the flesh. You see, you don't walk after the flesh but you live in the flesh. You see, we don't war after the flesh. We don't walk after the flesh. We walk in the spirit. But still, that doesn't mean that we don't have this flesh. And the flesh will always lust against the spirit. And that's why Paul said, I die daily. I die daily. You see? So, we have that responsibility also, to die daily. That's why when we read... That wonderful book, Fox's Book of Martyrs, we see the, our, our brothers and sisters that went before us when they were about to be executed for their faith. They weren't afraid, saying, oh no, please don't kill me. They were rejoicing, saying, away with this flesh. Away with it. I remember one particular part of that book where their mouths were stuffed with, with gunpowder. And, and they were, you know, they were, they were placed on top of a, I think they were placed on top of a, a, a pile of faggots with, with uh, gunpowder on it tied to stakes and they were about to fill their mouths with gunpowder and they were trying to get these Christians, these saints, to be afraid and to cry out for their lives. We're going to fill your mouths with gunpowder and blow your heads up. And these Christians, these beautiful brothers and sisters said, away with this flesh. Take it away. Let it be gone from us. This sinful, wicked flesh that wants us to sin, the sinful, wicked flesh, which is our only connection to this evil, wicked world that we have been saved from. Away with it. Don't threaten me. 
with graduation. Don't threaten me with the resurrection because I'm, I've been waiting my whole life since I've met Jesus Christ to get there. On with it. Do what you're going to do. Dispatch this evil flesh. Rip it into pieces. Blow it up. Burn it up. Whatever you will do with it. With all the power of the devil. Do it. What you Do what you must do. And send me home. That's what these saints cried out. You see? Much to the dismay of their tormentors who miser miserably failed in trying to, to, to get them to fear and tremble. You see, this flesh is vile. The flesh is vile. The flesh profiteth nothing, Jesus said. The flesh profiteth nothing. It is the spirit that quickeneth. And all the time that you and I live in this life, sister, we are living in this flesh. Okay? We can't escape that until the time comes when our spirit leaves our body in death. And as long as that happens, this flesh is going to lust against the spirit. What does that mean? It means that it is going to desire things that are contrary to the word of God. All right. Now let's look at 1 John, and let's begin in 1 John chapter 1, verse 5, and we're going to read into the second chapter. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. Now what does this mean? Does it mean that if we have a sinful thought, that we're walking in darkness? No, it doesn't mean that. And I've explained that before, and it's a very important point, uh, which I want to get into in, a couple, in the next couple of minutes here. The difference between having a thought and committing an action, you see. I might be sitting here right now, and I might be thinking about something that is sinful. Is that a sin? No, it's not. Because nothing has happened. Because I haven't done anything. But if I sit and meditate on that thought, until the point where it becomes manifest in my words or in my deeds, then it is sin. You see, because sin is the transgression of the law. Having a thought does not transgress the law, but meditating on that thought until it comes to fruition and causes you to speak or do something, that's the transgression of the law. You see. And so having a thought is not sinful. And that's very important for us to understand because the battlefield is the mind. And we cannot control sometimes the thoughts that come into our mind. Sometimes thoughts are suggested to us by unclean spirits. Or sometimes thoughts just come into our mind because of our carnal flesh, which lusts against the spirit. You see, sometimes our carnal mind, which is not subject to the law of God, imagines things that are contrary to the law of God. So what do we do when that happens? We cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. And this is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5. You see, when we cast down those thoughts, I cast down that thought in the name of Jesus Christ, for it is written, Thou shalt not steal. You see, I perhaps I was, you know, I just made that example for a second because I've made this example before. Like I was standing behind a woman one time in a grocery store and she was she had her cart and you know she was standing in front of her cart and in the back of her cart was her purse with like five or six one hundred dollar bills sticking out okay the enemy said you can take that and nobody will ever know um, so that's a situation where I as a Christian would say I cast that thought down in the name of Jesus Christ for it is written thou shalt not steal and thieves shall not inherit the kingdom of God that's how you cast down a thought like that. And by the way, I had a conversation with that woman and let her know that she, you know, was kind of irresponsible with her money. And she thanked me for that. She said, boy, if my husband found out I did that, he'd probably wring my neck. But, and I hope she never did that again. That's kind of really irresponsible. But anyway, I, I, I digress and I move on. Um, and that was many years ago. But that's how we cast down a thought, you see. And, 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 the fact that I had that thought, and I'm not saying I was meditating on stealing that woman's money, I'm just using that for an example. Um, the fact that I had or might have had that thought, I could take that and nobody would see. That's not a sin. You see, that's not a sin because that's just a thought that came into my mind. I didn't do anything to, to sin against God. I didn't transgress the law in anything. I had a thought, and then I, did the, I measured up that thought with the Word of God. I saw and recognized that it was not in accord with the Word of God, and so I cast it down, and it died without ever having been born. That's what we do with those thoughts that are contrary to God's Word.
It happened to me again this morning when I was praying unto the Lord. Unclean thoughts came into my mind. Lustful thoughts came into my mind. Has that ever happened to you? If you're honest, you have to say yes. Lustful thoughts came into my mind. And so I have to stop when I'm praying and say, I cast those evil thoughts down in the name of Jesus Christ. For it is written, the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Fornicators and whoremongers shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone. Now get behind me, Satan. I intend to continue praying to the Lord. That's how we deal with those kinds of thoughts. And the fact that I had those thoughts, or the fact that you have those thoughts from time to time, even when you're praying the presence of the Lord, that is not a sin. What is a sin is if you meditate on those thoughts to the point where you begin to manifest them, where you begin to give in to them and do those things that you are thinking about. That is the transgression of the law, and that is sin. Okay, that's a very important difference. So I hope I've driven that home and gotten that through to you, sister, and all of those of you out there who are listening as well. So let's go back to 1 John chapter 1, and we're in verse 6. It says, If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. All right? Walking in darkness, that means that we are not walking in the light of God's word. It means that we are walking in darkness, having fellowship with darkness. And, and Paul said in Ephesians, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them for that which is made manifest is, or excuse me, that which maketh manifest is light. Praise the Lord. So let's move on to verse seven. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. Okay. And of course, we know that 1 John is a, is a letter that was written to Christians, not to sinners. And so this, the, the people that received this letter were already baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost, of course. Otherwise, John wouldn't have called them his little children and brethren and, and things like that. So he says, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. Now, what happens if you're walking in the light and you have a thought about darkness. Does that mean that you're walking in the darkness? No. No, it doesn't. It means that you had a thought and you decided that that thought was unclean and you cast it down and you moved on and you're still walking in the light. You've never departed from walking in the light just because you had a thought that was pertaining to the darkness. That didn't take you off of the path of light. You see what I'm saying? Verse 8, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Oh no, Brother Clinton, what are you saying? Well, I'm saying what the Bible says. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. You know, many people, when I preach what the Bible says about holiness, many people in the, in the churches, they, they say to me things like, well, are you saying to me that you can never sin, that you never sin anymore? No, no, I'm not saying that at all. If I said that, I would be a liar. Because if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. We live in this flesh body. We have this carnal mind, and we have a battle daily. We must die daily. We must crucify and mortify this wicked, vile, evil, rotting, stinking, dying flesh daily. That is a battle that we face every day. All right? The temptation of sin does not go away. The thing that is done away is the fact that it used to have power over us. It used to be a Lord over us. And now Jesus Christ is Lord over us. And the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death in the members so that I can now do the things that I would. And I no longer have to say <clears throat> that which I would not, that I do. That which I allow, I, I would not like Paul was saying in Romans chapter 7. And the answer to Romans chapter 7 is Romans chapter 8, which is what I just spoke to you. Okay, But the law, the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Blessed be the name of the Lord. For, for what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. You see, it, it doesn't mean that the flesh is done away, but it means that we don't have to walk after the flesh anymore. We're not slaves to that. We're not under the law of sin in the members anymore. We have power over the law of sin in the members by the power of the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. You see, so we are no longer subject 
to that law of sin in the members, and therefore we are not under the law of God, but we have the one who gave the law in us, so that we by grace are able to fulfill the law by faith in Jesus Christ, fulfilling the righteousness of the law. You see, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. This is Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 4. And so we have power over the darkness by the one who is light, who is in us. We are baptized in his name, so our sins from the past are gone. And we're filled with his spirit, so we have the power to live above sin from now on. That... That doesn't mean that the temptation of sin goes away or that there is no battle. See, that's why it's called a battle, sister. That's why it's called a battle. Because every day, sin is going to tempt you. Every day. Now, that doesn't mean that you're going to have to sin every day and that you're still a sinner because you're not a sinner if you're a saint. If you're a Christian, you're a saint. And if you're a saint, you're not a sinner. Okay? That doesn't mean that there is no sin in you and it doesn't mean that you cannot sin. You see, there's only one of whom those things are true, and that's Jesus Christ, the Son of God, because his father was not Adam. See, he didn't come from Adam. His father was not Joseph, the son of Adam. His father was God. And so he's different than we are in that respect, because that's why he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings, and we are not. Although we are in him, we are not him. You see, so it was said, uh, it is said in the scripture of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, in him is no sin, and he did no sin. All right. Those things are not true of us, because the Bible says if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. You see, we must constantly be aware of the fact that there is sin in our members. There is sinfulness in our members. And when I say our members, I'm talking about the, the members of our human body, this physical body. The flesh lusts against the spirit. That's how it is. The flesh wants to covet, to steal, to commit fornication, to commit adultery, to murder, to hate, to, to, to do all the things that God commanded us not to do. You know, the, the greatest two commandments are, number one, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, soul, and strength. And number two, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And the flesh desires to draw us away from those things and do things that are contrary to those things all the time. So, sister... Welcome to the battlefield. Welcome to the battlefield. This battle is not going to go away until this flesh is laid down in the grave. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Let's continue in First John chapter seven, or First John chapter one, verse seven, or excuse me, verse eight. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we confess our sins. This is a letter written to the saints. It is not written to sinners. You see, it is written to saints. So why does John say if we confess our sins? Because we know that there is sin in our members. We know that this flesh desires and to lust against the spirit. It desires everything that God hates. You see, so we have a battle. And every once in a while, we're probably going to fail that battle. We're going to fail God. Okay, I've failed God many times, and so have you, whoever you are on the other side of this camera. If you're honest, you will have to admit that you have failed God many times. Okay, I'm not pointing my finger at you, because if I do that, I have three pointing right back at me. But we have all failed God. We have all failed God. We have all come short of the glory of God, period. And so if we confess our sins, we being Christians, baptized in his name, filled with his spirit, we are the saints. We are not sinners anymore. But we live in this flesh, and if we fail to walk in the Spirit and, and give in to a temptation and sin against the Lord, then if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Praise the Lord. What does that mean if you're cleansed from all unrighteousness? It means that you are righteous. It means that you have the power to get back up and continue on the battlefield that you were on, that you are on, and that you were fighting on. You see, when you commit a sin as a Christian, you feel terrible about it because you have broken the law, because you have dishonored God, because you have dishonored your own body in some cases, because you have failed God and you feel awful. Okay, that's a good thing. That means that God is showing you that you have sinned. So you go to God, you confess your sin, you forsake it, and then you have mercy. Whoso confesseth this sin and forsaketh it shall have mercy. You see, Proverbs 28, 13. 
So when you do that, God is faithful just to forgive your sin and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. What does that do? It puts you back on the path that you were on before you sinned so that that sin is done away with and you're back on the righteous narrow path that leadeth unto life eternal. You see, why does God provide this for us in his word? Because he knows that we need it. Now, am I saying it's a good thing to sin? Am I saying it's okay to sin? It doesn't really matter because God will forgive you? No, I'm not saying that at all. And John's not saying that either, and he'll make that clear in the next couple of verses. So let's just keep reading. Verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. You know, even the hypocrites that were getting ready to stone that woman that they caught in adultery, that they brought to Jesus in the 8th chapter of John, even they had to admit, when they were confronted with the truth, that they had sinned. Because Jesus said, sure, go ahead. Whosoever is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And of all those people that were so filled with rage and wanted to murder this woman with stones, that's a very gruesome way to murder somebody, as if there were a, a nice, polite way. But that's a very gruesome way to murder somebody, and they had this in their heart to do it. And that one simple statement from Jesus caused them all to throw down their stones on the ground and leave. Because not one of them was willing to stand there and say that they were without sin because that would have been a ridiculous statement because everybody knows that all men have sin. You see? And so he goes on to say, My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. Okay? John says, These things write I unto you that ye sin not. He didn't say these things write I unto you because it's okay to sin, and if you do so, just tell the Father about it, and it'll be all right. No, he said, These things write I unto you that ye sin not, because God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. Okay? So John's saying, I write these things unto you that ye sin not, because I don't want you to sin, because God doesn't want you to sin. You see? But... And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. You see? So when that time comes that you do fall down and commit a sin, fall down and skin your knee, so to speak, in a spiritual sense, then you don't have to, you know, imagine that you were condemned forever and that you just blew it and you're never going to enter into the kingdom of God because of sin. No, that's why these things are provided for us, because we have this battle daily. And every once in a while, we will fail God. Every once in a while, that's going to happen. Okay? I'm not saying it's a good thing or a right thing or an acceptable thing. I'm just saying it's reality. And it's going to happen from time to time because we live on a battlefield. And so if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteousness, the righteous. Excuse me. And what is an advocate? Well, it's like when you have a lawyer. You know, your lawyer speaks for you. He knows the law. He, he knows the judge. So he speaks for you. That's what it means, an advocate. When we... If we, it says, and if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. In other words, we can come to the Father, the Almighty God, and we can plead forgiveness for our sin in the name of His Son, Jesus Christ. And His Son, Jesus Christ, is there to say, yes, I paid that penalty. I shed my blood for that sin. Blessed be the name of the Lord. That's why he is our advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Okay. Now, there's a lot more in 1 John that I would love to go over with you, but I've already been speaking for almost a half an hour, so I'm going to cut this video short for now. But I just want to let you know these things, sister. Number one, you're on a battlefield, and that battlefield is not going to go away. It's not, your enemy is not going to, to, to go away forever until the time that you leave this life. You will always in this life be walking in a human body. And though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. Remember, we talked about that. It's in first, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5. So you have a battle to fight. Okay, The fact that you are born again, the fact that you are born of water and of the Spirit, the fact that you are saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, doesn't mean that sin is not going to be in your members. It doesn't mean that sin is going to go away, or the temptation of sin is going to go away. 
What it means is that you have the power to overcome it now. You are no longer a slave to it. You have the power and authority to say no. You have the power and authority to cast down thoughts and imaginations that are contrary to the Word of God instead of meditating on them until the point where you do them because you used to be a slave to sin. You're not a slave to sin anymore. Sin shall not have dominion over you because you are not under the law but under grace. So welcome to the battlefield, my sister, and rejoice in the fact that you have the victory. You are no longer a slave to sin. But that doesn't mean that the battle has ceased to exist. What it means is that now you have the power and the authority to walk in victory. May this message be a blessing to you, my dear sister, and to all, all those of you out there who may have been struggling with the same things. I love you in Jesus' name, and I'm here for you. If I may be a minister to you, if I may be of help to you, in the name of Jesus Christ and in his gospel, write to me. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Peace to you.